Thank you, thank you. Yeah, it was funny, before service, someone was asking, he was like, who are those people right there, Amy and Ryan? I was like, oh, they're OGs. They, they started the church way back with us. They were, they've been there from the beginning. It's so fun having you all here. Um, man, it is always a blessing to get to be up here and, and talk to all y'all, especially after yesterday. Man, Bama gave me a heart attack yesterday, guys. Oh, my gosh. I know y'all, y'all don't all watch college football, but... It was. Roll Tide. Roll Tide. We pulled it off. We won 20 to 19. We were supposed to win by 20 points, guys. We won 20 to 19. Dear Lord, baby Jesus, I prayed so much yesterday. Um, (laughs) So I get to start off this morning. Let's talk about something that I actually really enjoy. It's frustrating. I have like a hate-love relationship with it. Um, And I get to start off with saying a dirty word in church. It is a seven-letter word. Brie, I don't know, because H- she's HR. If you have an issue, you go to Brie. If you need to cover your ears, you can cover your ears. That's between you and Jesus. Are you ready? Progress. Yeah, I saw some of y'all squirm in your seats there. You didn't know about that. Progress. Or not progress, sorry, process. Did I say progress? Man, I'm all over the place. <laughs> Process. I'm saying so many seven seven letter words this morning. <laughs> Process. Process. Mmm. Some of y'all right now thinking about the process that you're going through. You're like, why'd you have to mention that, Kyle? Why did you have to talk about process this morning? Let's talk about progress, not process. Come on. <laughs> we don't like process. It's like a dirty word. We don't like it, right? Especially in today's culture where instant gratification, right? We get upset when Amazon Prime is two-day delivery. We're like, wait, they have one day. I know they can do one day now. Why do I have to wait two? We want it now, right? It's it's my money. I want it now. Process. Mm, But God likes process. God likes process. Now, Before I dive into talking about process this morning, I want to say when I'm talking about process, this is not what I'm talking about. I am not talking about a process to become more holy, a process to become more righteous, a process to become more in union with God. That was a one-step process that took place 2,000 years ago on that guy right there. Okay. There is a process in believing what Jesus accomplished. There is a process in maturing. There is a process in going deeper into your relationship with God. There is a process of walking out our prophetic words and um, the destiny that God has laid in place for us. So that is the process that I will be talking about today, is how do we walk through that process? Because it's not always fun. So I, I, I like to look stuff up. I love, I love diving in. Just give me the definitions of stuff. I want to figure out what stuff means. There's, I will read these like huge, thick theology books that I have to have a dictionary with me because I have no idea what they're talking about. I'm like, this looks really good. And I'm reading. I'm like, they're making up words in here, guys. These are not real words. <laughs> um, but so according to the dictionary... A process is a series of actions or steps in order to achieve a particular end. So what is the end? What is that end goal? I like to think for that, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pull in two scriptures. The first, I'm just going to read, I'm going to read real quickly. It's um, 1 John 15, 16. You have not chosen me, but I have chosen you. And I have appointed you, I have planted you, that you might go and bear fruit and keep on bearing, and that your fruit may be lasting, that it may remain, abide, so that whatever you ask the Father in my name, he may give it to you. Or Psalms 1.3, and he shall be like a tree firmly planted and tended by the streams of water, ready to bring forth fruit in its season. Its leaf also shall not fade or wither, and everything he does shall prosper." In the Passion, it says, they will be standing firm like a flourishing tree planted by God's design, deeply rooted by the brooks of bliss, bearing fruit in every season of their lives. They are never dry, never fainting, ever blessed, ever plentiful. What's the end goal of process? 
to bear fruit in every season. It's to bear fruit in the midst of the process. Not just at the end of it. Banning Liebscher, uh, he's the pastor at Jesus Culture, and he says, uh, hold on, I'm going to get this right. Fruit means that when people taste your life, you taste like Jesus. I know, I'm like, oh my gosh, what do I, I hope I taste like Jesus. <laughs> I'm like, oh man, okay. I didn't taste like Jesus when I was freaking out at the game yesterday. <laughs> um, we, <laughs> that's a process. <laughs> I went through process yesterday. Um, you know, we talk about, we talk about judge, we judge others, we judge ministries, we judge people by their fruit, right? And that can be anything. It doesn't, in my examples, I'm gonna use ministry because I feel like we use it the most in ministry, but it can be for businesses. It can be for relationships. It can be for anything as we judge it by its fruit. But a, a trend that I have seen is that we judge the, the fruit that we are now claiming is, well, look at, are they financially well off? Is that, is that fruit? Or look at how many signs and wonders and miracles are happening in that ministry. Is, is that the fruit? Or look how many salvations. Is that the fruit? I'm going to propose that it's not the fruit. The fruit is love, joy, peace. Patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, self-control. Not how many signs and wonders are taking place in your church. Those are amazing. I love them. I'm all about it, man. I, my boys, for the first time we saw, uh, we were watching a Bethel set, and it was a glory cloud one, and they are like, what is that? And I was like, I was there. Let me tell you. Oh, my gosh. It was awesome. It was amazing. It's the craziest thing I've ever seen. There's gold dust floating in the sky that came out of nowhere. Um, I love that. That's not fruit. It's amazing. It's fun. I want to hear that ministry there. They're some of the most patient, loving, gentle, kind people I've ever met. These people over here, they have self-control. They're, they're patient. They're peaceful. That's That's fruit. Right, And so he's, he's planted us, he's grafted us in, he has made it as easy as possible <laughs> for us to be rooted in him so that we can bear fruit in every season. So that we can thrive in every situation, every storm, from every peaceful meadow to like, you know, like in Lord of the Rings when they're like climbing up the mountain and saw the snows blasting them and they're like, oh, we can't go on. Like, I want you to thrive there. <laughs> it's like, I want you producing fruit when you're on top of the mount, mountains of uh, the Misty Mountains. I want you up there. I want you being able to, to um, produce fruit, to be peaceful and loving and kind so that we can thrive. He wants us to thrive in our process. So we see time and time again throughout the scriptures, we see God taking people, walking them through a process to get them where he wants them. And the people I love, I love that Madeline said, the people that, that we hear about are the people that made it through that process, right? They're the people that said yes. They're the people that, that did what God was saying. They're the people who thrived in their process. First, we can look at the life of Joseph. Had this amazing dream, dream that everyone's gonna bow down to him. His father favors him. His brothers are like, I hate you. We're gonna kill you, <laughs> right? They sell him, they sell him to slavery, like, this is not my dream, Lord. This is not the dream you gave me. I'm now a slave. <laughs> Talk about process. Golly, man. Our process is like, I don't know. I can't even think of an example right now. Our process is not becoming a slave for 13 years and <laughs> working up our way. Um, he he becomes, uh, becomes a slave in Potiphar's household. It says that uh, they've done the math, basically. It was 13 years from him being sold into slavery to him becoming Pharaoh's right hand. 13 years of process. Ugh. Like, let's speed up the timeline, Jesus. 13 years. But this is, I love this. This is what it says. Genesis 39. It says, his master saw, speaking about Potiphar, it says his master saw that the Lord was with him and that the Lord caused all that he did to succeed in his hands. So Joseph found favor. So in the midst of being a slave, Joseph's like, I'm going to do this with excellence. 
I'm going to do this well because I'm in relationship with God. I'm going to represent him. I'm going to stay true to who I am. I'm going to control my inner world, and I'm not going to let my outside, the outside circumstances affect me. I'm going to thrive in this process because I know the dream that God gave me. I'm going to cling to that, and so I'm going to stick with the process. And we know that Potiphar's wife tries to seduce him. He flees. He gets framed. He's thrown in prison. Guess what it says about the prison warden? He saw that everything that Joseph touched succeeded, and he found favor. He saw that the Lord was with him, and so he found favor. And so Joseph, as a prisoner, is now given control of the prison. It literally says that the, that the, the prison guard didn't even check in on the stuff that Joseph was over because he knew it was handled well. When's the last time we let a prisoner run the prison? But he stayed true. He's like, oh, great, God. This is the process. I'm here. I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna cheat it. I'm gonna stay true to who I am. Until eventually he gets to interpret Pharaoh's dream and he's, he's at the right hand. And he is made, because he interprets one dream, he is made to be the right hand of the most powerful person in the world. Egypt was like the kingdom. And he's put in charge of everything. Pharaoh's like, yeah, you have all the power. The only person you're not more important than is me. Go have fun and save our region from famine. <laughs> you know, go do what you're supposed to do. And he, and he prospers, and he does. He saves the region from famine. All because he was willing to sit in the process. And he learned how to thrive in it. He learned how to steward himself in that process. One thing I love about this Joseph story is when he finally has reconciliation and uh, his brothers and, and his father Israel, right? Jacob comes and lives with him in Egypt. And when Israel dies, he says, don't bury me here. Bury me back in Canaan. So Israel dies. And Joseph goes to Pharaoh and says, hey, my dad wants to be buried over there. Can I go? He's like, yes, go. But don't go alone. They send a procession with him to go mourn the death of Israel. They bury him. In Jewish culture, the Hebrews, they would mourn for seven days. Egypt mourned for 70. And they didn't mourn for Joseph. No, they mourned for his dad who did nothing. When's the last time we mourned 70 days, not because the person who did everything died, but because of his dad died? The impact that he had because he embraced the process. The next, we can look at the life of David. I'm gonna go short on, on David because I'm excited to jump into Daniel. And we talk about David all the time. Um, but David, David was anointed king, right? And it was, they estimated it was 17 to 20 years before he became king. It's even longer than Joseph's process, dear Lord. Uh, 17 to 20 years, right? And he went through a process of killing lions and bears to killing Goliath to becoming a mighty warrior to becoming an outlaw and being hunted down by the king. Now we're gonna jump into Daniel. I'm excited to talk about Daniel. Because Daniel, I love, I love this thing of, I mean, you see here even Dan, David, or yeah, David. You see Joseph, you see um, David, you see Daniel. They all served evil kings. Joseph literally served Pharaoh who Pharaoh is believed to be a god. He's pagan, but he served him. He served him faithfully. You see David, he's serving, a faithful, uh, serving faithfully to Saul, who is trying to kill him. Now you see Daniel, who's serving pagan kings as he gets captured and brought into enslavement and uh, into Babylon. And I love, I mean, all these things, this is something too, guys. All they did is interpret dreams. For Joseph and Daniel, they interpret dreams and they found favor. Wow. Now, Daniel, this is something. So, so Daniel, the first king that he served was King Darius. And Darius is the one who, he, Daniel rises up. He's like his right hand. He's his top advisor. The other advisors are jealous. So they plot the rule, you know, like, we're Darius. We should only worship you. We shouldn't worship anyone else. And Darius is like, yeah, that's a good idea. <laughs> Everybody worship me. And Daniel's like, I can't do that. I'm gonna, oh, that went loud. I'm gonna, I'm gonna worship uh, God. He gets caught. 
So Darius realizes he's been tricked, but he has to stick to his law. So he throws him in the lion's den. And it says that that night that King Darius tossed and turned, he couldn't sleep. He wakes up first, like wakes up, he couldn't sleep, gets up in the morning, he runs to the, um, to the lion's den and he says, Daniel, did your God save you? Who knows what his response is? His response is, my king lived forever. His response is to bless the man that gave him a death sentence. His response is to say, oh, my king, may you live forever. Yes, my God closed the mouths of the lions. Mm. Mm. Sometimes I feel like we have a problem with blessing people we disagree with. We have a problem with blessing people that that we see as an enemy when Jesus literally tells us to bless our enemies. And here we have Daniel saying, yeah, you just threw me in the lion's den so I could die. May you live forever. I want to see your kingdom reign. So, well, here's the thing too. Here's the thing with, with Daniel is he would have known, he would have known the prophets, he would have known Jeremiah, the book of Jeremiah. And in Jeremiah 29, seven, it says, also seek the peace and the prosperity of the city to which I have carried you into exile. Pray to the Lord for it, because if it prospers, you too will prosper. Daniel grabbed hold of this promise that, hey, if I bless my city, then Israel's gonna prosper. If I bless the city that I am enslaved to, if I help it succeed, then Israel will succeed. So I'm going to embrace this process. I'm gonna embrace what the Lord has declared. One thing I love too about about Daniel, so the next king that Daniel, not the next, I think he did Nebuchadnezzar. The last one that he serves is Cyrus, King Cyrus. Now, Cyrus is actually known as the first champion of human rights. He's the one that when he comes in, he sends the Israelites back home, he released all the slaves, they get to go back to their, their, homelands, and there's this, there's this artifact called the Cyrus Cylinder, and it tells of Cyrus coming into Babylon peacefully, and how he then freed the slaves, sent exiles back to their homelands, allowed for freedom of religion, and called for racial equality. Known today as the Cyrus Cylinder, this ancient record has now been recognized as the world's first charter of human rights. It is translated into all six official languages of the United Nations, and its provisions parallel the first four articles of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. Now, what I'm about to say, I can't back up with with scripture, but I like to do some algebra here, right? If A equals B and B equals C, then A equals C, okay? I can work this out in my head. If Daniel is a top advisor to Cyrus, Daniel had a play in writing these laws. So Daniel's impact is still felt today because he embraced the process. We have this, uh, this is, I'm rabbit trailing right here, but there's this, this thing with the, um, we talk about the seven mountains a lot, right? You have the seven mountains and and it's like business, education, church, family, there's all things, and they're, they're great, they're amazing. It's a great way to look at everything. But we like to, I remember the first time I heard the teaching, and it was always this thing of, we need to conquer the seven mountains. The church needs to conquer the seven mountains. And it never sat with me. We're supposed to serve the seven mountains. We're supposed to serve them. We're supposed to come in low and infiltrate them, right? The kingdom is like leaven, and when it's worked into dough, it expands. There was a time not too long ago where you could turn on Netflix and it was flooded with Christian movies. Every single household, they had every single Christian movie from the super cheesy ones to the okay ones, they were there. They were all there. Now you turn on Netflix and it's full of what? It's full of garbage. There's like one or two good shows and then it's like, man, this is full of witchcraft. This is full of sexual immorality. This is, what is this? Because the church pulled itself away and we created pure flicks. So now all the Christian movies are over there when we had the chance for them to be right there on Netflix in every single household where someone would say, what is this movie? I'm gonna watch it. Yeah. 
We're going to go a little over. The last guy I want to talk about is Paul. Paul, can I, can I pop a Paul bubble for y'all? Are y'all okay with that? Are y'all okay? I love, I love hearing this, um, but do you know that God never changed Saul's name to Paul? It is not in the Bible. It's not there. It's a great prophetic word. I, I love it. But, and I get the, get the heart behind it, but it's actually not, not there. Saul is his Hebrew name. Paul is his Roman name. Which I love because you see when, when Saul goes from persecuting Christians, right? He encounters God. You still read throughout the book of Acts and it is Saul, Saul, Saul. Saul and Barnabas, Saul and Barnabas, Saul and Barnabas. Then all of a sudden you have, or no, sorry, Paul and Barnabas. Paul and Saul, or, no, oh my gosh. <laughs> Barnabas and Saul, Barnabas and Saul, Barnabas and Saul as they're doing ministry and, and Barnabas is encouraging him and raising him up. And then there's this point where it says Saul and Barnabas. And then from there on, it is Paul and Barnabas. Do you know what changed? They began ministering to the Gentiles. Paul says, I will be all things to all people. They need to know me as Paul. They need to know me as a Roman citizen preaching the gospel because that's how they're gonna be able to receive me. Right? Paul walks through a process he goes from killing Christians to the biggest proponent of the gospel that we've ever seen. Right? It's two-thirds of the New Testament. I mean, the guy had a revelation of Jesus that still baffles our mind to this day. We still debate what he means in scriptures. Um, we have Philippians 4. Philippians 4, 11 through 13. And it says, I'm not telling you this because I need money, for I have learned to be satisfied with whatever I have, I know what it means to lack and I know what it means to experience overwhelming abundance. For I'm trained in the secret of overcoming all things, whether in fullness or in hunger, and I find that the very strength of Christ's explosive power infuses me to conquer every difficulty. That was from the, the Passion, the message says, actually, I don't have a sense of needing anything personally. I've learned by now to be quite content whatever my circumstances. I'm just as happy with little as with much, with much as with little, I found the recipe for being happy, whether full or hungry, hands full or hands empty, whatever I have, wherever I am, I can make it through anything in the one who makes me who I am. So see, Paul is basically saying, wherever you find me on this journey, wherever you find me in this process, wherever you find me in life, I will be thriving. I'm not gonna let my situations and my circumstances dictate my inner world. I am content, I am satisfied because I have Christ. Can we thrive even when things don't look how we thought they'd look? I was not thriving yesterday when Bama was down <laughs> by two points with a minute 20 to go. Oh my gosh. <laughs> so many times we delay our happiness. We delay it. We say, well, I'll be happy when I have a better job. I can thrive once I have a bigger house. I can, you know, once I'm debt free, things will be good. No. Learn in the moment, embrace the process and be like, okay, God, what do you have for me right here? Because I know you're more than enough. I know you're more than enough. So what is it? So I'm gonna give three tips to thrive in the process. This first one, I say to myself more than I would like to admit. Um, <clears throat> Jonathan knows all, a little, I'll say it to Jonathan all the, all the time. There's people and it's build the wall. Build the wall in front of you. In Nehemiah 3, the Israelites have come back to, to Jerusalem and they're rebuilding the wall. And there's a verse, I believe it's Nehemiah 3, it's either 28 or 29, and it says that the priests built the wall that were outside of their homes. I'm kind of summarizing it. But basically, hey, step out your door. What's that section of the wall? Okay, that's the section that you're, you're repairing. And so it is this thing of build the wall. It's do what God has placed in front of you and do it well. Sometimes we find ourselves struggling, like we're like, man, I'm not thriving in life. And it's because you've got your eyes on someone else's wall. It's because you're looking saying, I wish I was there. I wish I had that tool. I liked how they did that. Why didn't I do that? God, why am I here? Why am I not there? You gave me a word that I'm gonna be there, but I'm here. What's going on? 
shut up and build the wall. <laughs> build, the, build the wall. Stop complaining and build the wall. And I'll tell you this, sitting there, because I've, I've been in this season before, where I'm like, man, I do not, my passion is not building this wall. I do not want to build this wall. This is not the dream you gave me. Why am I building this wall? Building the wall, being faithful and stewarding and building that wall is not giving up on your dream. It's trusting God with your dream. It's saying, okay, God, I'm going to build this wall and I'm trusting you with the rest. And I'm going to do it well. I'm going to do it with excellence. I'm going to do it with a smile on my face. All right? <laughs> We're so quick to, we, we want to do what we're passionate about. And that's amazing. Sometimes God is like, yeah, I want you to do that too, but I, you're building the wall right now. There was a time in, in college, but before I worked for Bethesda, I worked for a law firm doing foreclosures, guys. I was not happy. <laughs> I did not enjoy foreclosures. Do not come for me for legal advice. I cannot help you. Um, <laughs> uh, it, was, it was not what I want to do, but I did it well. I said, okay, God, what do you want me to learn in this season? What am I here for? When I actually left, when I turned in my notice, they sat me down and said, how much do we need to pay you to keep you? I was like, nothing. I'm going to go work for Bethesda. Peace out. <laughs> I'm done with this. <laughs> I got to the end of my wall here. I'm done. My, um, <laughs> right? <laughs> there was a time in, in college. I was a senior in college. I remember I'm working on this assignment, and my dad calls and says, hey, do you want to go to Guatemala? Your mom's going on a mission trip to Guatemala. Do you want to go? And I sat there for a minute. I'm like, I have no passion for Guatemala. <laughs> nope, I'm good. And finished my conversation, hung up, and, and I'm sitting there typing. And my dad, or my dad, well, yeah, God's like, hey, you're, you're going to Guatemala. And I'm like, no, I don't know if you deserve it. I said, no. And he was like, I was like, God, I'm not, I'm not passionate about Guatemala. He's like, no, but I am. That's right. And I was like, oh, oh, okay. Got back on the phone, called my dad, and I said, Dad, I'm going to Guatemala. He's like, yeah, I thought it was weird that you said no. <laughs> I went to Guatemala. It was amazing. Okay, the second, the second thing, tips on thriving, is don't rush the process. Don't rush the process. I love this because I've already been talking about Alabama, right? Nick Saban, he's the head coach for Alabama, the greatest college football coach in the history of college football. But he, they have a saying. There's a saying in, in Bama, and you will see it on like Bama fans with forums and whatnot, and it's trust the process. Yep. Trust the process. And he has this saying. It says, don't think about winning the SEC championship. Don't think about the national championship. Think about what you need to do in this drill, on this play, in this moment. That's the process. Let's think about what we can do today, the task at hand. Right? And even now, I mean, there's so many prophetic words that even for me that I've received, and I'm like, Okay, I can't, I don't want to rush them. I'm going to sit on them. The Lord's going to carry me through it. He's going to get me there. Yeah, I want to be there, but I know that there's a process to get there. I, um, some, sometimes we think, right, the process is A, B, C, D, E, F, G, those steps. Man, sometimes the process is like A, Q, R, <laughs> D, E, G. And we're like, what is going on right now? <laughs> Embrace the process. Embrace the journey. God's taking you where he wants you, right? It literally, it says, trust in the Lord with all your heart, lead not on your understanding, and he will direct your steps. Yeah, so Got to give up the right to understand. He's like, all right, Lord, where are we going? That does not seem logical to me, but all right, we'll go that way. I love, uh, I love barbecue. Um, low and slow, y'all. Low and slow. Now, here's the, here's the thing. I have to say this, Okay. Because when I moved out to the West Coast, I remember the first time someone said, hey, we're having a barbecue. Come over. I'm like, heck yeah, let's go. And I get there, and there's hamburgers and hot dogs. And I'm like, that is not a barbecue. Dear Lord, that is grilling out. That is, we're grilling out. Come over. Barbecue is low and slow. It is pulled pork. It is brisket. It is ribs. It is chicken. It is give me the barbecue sauce. That is barbecue, all right? <laughs> But I love it. I have my own, I have my own offset wood-burning smoker at home. You can't rush it. You can't rush it. If I rush it, it's not going to fall apart. It's going to be burnt, crispy, dried-out meat. I don't want that. I want to cook it at like 225, 250 for eight hours so that it falls apart. That's what I want. That's what you guys want too, I know. <laughs> right? Don't rush the process. David, David had the opportunity twice 
twice to take out Saul. He could have rushed the process. And he didn't. The last one, I think this is the most, the most important, is intimacy. Intimacy. You want to thrive in the process, you got to burn for him. You look at the lives that we talked about of Joseph and David and Daniel and, and Paul, they burned for him. They burned for him to a point where the process didn't look like process. There's a great quote that says, People around you may say, look at how you're serving the Lord, but you are drunk with love. You didn't notice that you'd lifted a finger. The greatest saints who paid the most tremendous price throughout church history were the same ones who could genuinely say, it was nothing, I was in love. It was nothing. Can you say as you're walking through the process, this is nothing, I'm in love. Jesus, as going to the cross, this is nothing, I'm in love. For the joy set before him, he endured the cross. He's like, yep, you're worth it. I'm in love. Can we, as we walk through our process, say, it's okay, I'm in love. I trust Jesus. I trust that he's gonna get me where I need to be. And it isn't a, it's in that intimacy, it's, it's in that rest that we're able to produce fruit. The fruit naturally comes, right? I always give this example of, of a tree. A tree isn't sitting there going, ah, come on, give me some fruit. Let's go. Oh, yeah, got it. Check it out, man. Check out my fruit. Look at that. Got it right there. No, no. The tree sits there. Its roots go down deep because it's next to the streams of living water, right? It comes out and it expands in the glory of the sun. And the fruit naturally produces it isn't striving to make it happen. It's through rest and intimacy. It's from being close with the one who's an all-consuming fire, being close to the source of living waters that we're able to produce fruit naturally and easily. It's through intimacy. There's a, um, a quote I read years ago, um, not years old, maybe like two, three years ago, um, by a, a woman named Dr. Jean Hardy. And I have no idea who she is. <laughs> I, know, I, know, uh, I know her grandkids, though. I went to school with her grandkids, and their grand, one of the grandsons posted this. And it says, in life, just as in music, the rests are equally important as the notes. Play the rests. When you're looking at music and you have the sheet music going, there's rests. You have to play them. You can't just skip over them and keep going. The music doesn't flow right. Play the rest. Take the time to rest in his presence, to refresh yourself. And lastly, in the, in the midst of these storms and these, these seasons, it's having the ability, right? Julian of Norwich would say, and all shall be well, and all shall be well, and in all manner of things, all shall be well. It's knowing that truth. It's knowing that God's got me. Despite the craziness, despite the storms, God has me, he loves me, I love him, and I get to thrive in this process. There's, um, I'm gonna read this real quick and then we'll be, we'll be done. <clears throat> Who here's ever heard of Horatio Spafford? A few of you, yeah, raising your hands. So he lived from 1828 to 1888. He was a wealthy Chicago lawyer with a thriving legal practice, a beautiful home, a wife, four daughters and a son. He was also a devout Christian and faithful student of the scriptures. His circle of and friends included Dwight L. Moody, Ira Sankey, and various other well-known Christians of the day. At the very height of his financial and professional success, Horatio and his wife Anna suffered the tragic loss of their son. Shortly thereafter, on October 8th, 1871, the great Chicago fire destroyed almost every real estate investment that Spafford had. In 1873, Spafford scheduled a boat trip to Europe in order to give his wife and daughters a much needed vacation and time to recover from the tragedy. He also went to join Moody and Sankey on an uh, evangelistic campaign in England. Spafford sent his wife and daughters ahead of him while he remained in Chicago to take care of some unexpected last minute business. Several days later, he received notice that his family's ship had encountered a collision all four of his daughters drowned, only his wife survived. 
With a heavy heart, Spafford boarded a boat that would take him to his grieving Anna in England. And it was on that trip that he penned these now famous words. When sorrow like sea billows roll, it is well, it is well with my soul. Talk about thriving in the process. In the midst of heartache and loss and pain, he's able to say, it's well. It's going to be okay because God's with me. Because God is faithful and God is good. And I'm going to learn how to thrive in the process. Let's all stand. And I want you, I want you to declare this with me. The last thing we're going to do, we're going to, we're going to declare this. Say this with me. Say, I will be standing firm like a flourishing tree planted by God's design, deeply rooted by the brooks of bliss, bearing fruit in every season of my life. I will never dry, never faint. Ever blessed, ever blessed, ever plentiful. Ever blessed. Amen.